Hi everybody, uh, Pastor Tim Warner here coming to you from my office in South Carolina. This is the Bereans Bible Institute. We're in module number seven on the apostolic mission. Today we'll, we'll pick up part two on the um, on Pentecost, which will be uh, actually lesson number four in this whole series. <clears throat> um, we left off last time uh, talking about the first part of Acts chapter one, where... Um, these uh, supernatural tongues or languages, <clears throat> uh, something occurred in the upper room where the holy breath of God came upon the 120 disciples there, and they began to speak in these other languages. Last time we spent some time talking about the prophecy of this in Isaiah chapter 28, which Paul actually cited in 1 Corinthians 14. Um where it says, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak unto this people. Uh, yet for all that, they will not hear me. <clears throat> One of the things I pointed out last time was that the prophecy in Isaiah that talks about this, it gives specifically the content of the message that was being proclaimed in these foreign languages. And that was, this is the rest, this is the refreshing things of that nature, but all pointing to, actually pointing to the the um, the way in which Israel would be able to enter into the covenant, uh, the kingdom, actually. <clears throat> anyway, let's pick up in verse 5 and look at the reaction of the crowd to this phenomenon. Verse 5, And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and the reason that it, it specifically says they were Jews is because um, it was the day, the festival of Pentecost, and the Jews were required, uh, the males were required uh, three times a year to go up to Jerusalem to celebrate the festivals. And that was for the Passover season, for Pentecost, and then for the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall. So we had all these Jews gathered, it says, from every nation uh, under heaven, and that, of course, is referring to the Roman Empire, um, where all these little Jewish communities were scattered um, around. <clears throat> all right, so it says, verse 6, And when this sound occurred, that is, these 120 speaking in these foreign languages, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Now, <clears throat> I need to uh, clarify this, because a lot of people point to this passage and they think that the miracle was not in the speaking the foreign languages, that the miracle was in the hearing. That is, somewhere between the, the sound leaving the mouth of these people and going through the air and entering into the ears of the uh, people that were listening, that there was a translation, a supernatural translation, and that's not at all well, what this is talking about. Because if you go back... Um, into verse 4, it clearly says that they all were filled with the holy breath and began to speak with other or foreign languages. So <clears throat> they were actually speaking the foreign languages. And, and remember, they what was the sign that had just occurred prior to this? And that was there was a tongue, a tongue that appeared to be on fire that divided and went and stood upon the head of each of these men. And that symbolizes speech. It doesn't symbolize hearing. It symbolizes speech. It symbolizes a fiery tongue of judgment, uh, pronouncing God's judgment uh, upon Israel, and also the way of escape, the way to escape that judgment and to have an inheritance in the coming kingdom. All right, so he says, um, verse 7, <clears throat> they were all amazed and marveled, saying, um, marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? Now, Galilee was the part of Israel that was up in the north. And Judea was in the south. And in between you have Samaria. Well, in Judea, down in the southern part of, of Israel, the... The la there was a there was a mix of languages. You know there was in fact when Jesus was crucified, <clears throat> you may remember that Pilate had the inscription over his cross um, put up, which was translated into uh, it says Hebrew, which actually refers to Aramaic, the language of the Jews, 
Aramaic and in Latin and in Greek. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. So you had that written three times in three languages above the cross. And the reason for that was all three of these languages were commonly spoken in Judea, in Jerusalem, that whole area of southern Israel. Now, the language of the temple, the language of the scholars at the temple um, would have been Hebrew, no doubt. <clears throat> because they were, they were in fact handling the scrolls that were written in Hebrew, you know, the scrolls of Moses, the Torah, and so forth, and they were handling those. But Aramaic, uh, which is very closely related to Hebrew, was the spoken language as opposed to the written language, which was Hebrew. Aramaic was the spoken language, and then you also had Greek uh, widely spoken in Judea because Greek was the language of trade and um, you know, pretty much the whole Roman Empire spoke Greek. And so if you wanted to do commerce, you know, with trade in and out, you had to speak Greek as well, perhaps as your, as your mother tongue, if you had another language. And then, of course, Latin was the language of Rome itself. Um, and, of course, the officials and so forth would have spoken Latin there. <clears throat> so, but the point is, the, the question then is, what language did the Galileans speak because they are pointing out that these men are all Galileans. And as I said before, Galilee is up in the north. The language of Galilee, we don't know for sure what the language, if there was a specific language of Galilee, but probably it was either Aramaic or Greek and most likely Greek. The farther we get away from Jerusalem, <clears throat> the more likely it was that the most common language being spoken outside of J Jerusalem and Judea would be Greek because, again, a lot of the people were not highly educated up in Galilee. And because of that, they typically would not be multilingual. So <clears throat> if that's the case, then they would have, the language that they would have learned would be the language of trade. Uh, you know, uh, the disciples, P uh, Peter, James, John, were fishermen. They were tradesmen, and so in order to trade, they would have to speak Greek. So almost certainly, when they say these men, you know, talk when they uh, these people are talking about these men are Galileans, it was because they were first of all uneducated men. Secondly, they were Greek speaking, naturally Greek speaking men, as opposed to um, <clears throat> these other languages. Now. Let's look at um, uh, verse 8. It says, how is it? Well, go back to 7, sorry. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Now, the reason they say that is because there were little Jewish communities that had settled down all over the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was a big conglomerate of nations that Rome had conquered and was trying to rule and kind of keep together under one central authority. But the farther you get from the central authority and you kind of trickle down to the local authorities, the, the more you have um, expressions of the culture, the common culture, the common language of those areas. <clears throat> and so a Jew who was born into a Jewish community in, in Rome would speak Latin. A Jew who was born into a Jewish community, you know, in, in Greece would speak Greek. A, a Jew, you know, who was born in a Jewish community in, in lots of other places would speak the local languages of those areas. They would know the local language as well as the common language. <clears throat> that is, they were bilingual. So it says... How is it that we hear each in our own language in which we are born? And now he begins to list a, um, a, whole, a listing of nations or nationalities that had their own languages. And so he says uh, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia. Now this is going all the way out into Iraq and, and to the east. <clears throat> then it says Judea. Notice it says Judea. 
And they were surprised that some of these Galileans were speaking in the language of Judea, which is southern Israel. Now, the point of that is that it, what it shows is that since Aramaic was probably the common language of Judea, that the Galileans were not normally speaking Aramaic. They were speaking Greek. All right. Um, anyway, and it says, uh, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, adjoining to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, and then he qualifies the ones from Rome as both Jews and proselytes. Now, Jews are those who were naturally born descendants of Abraham. Proselytes were people who were not descendant of Abraham, but they had converted to Judaism. They had been circumcised. They were keeping the law. They attended the synagogues and so forth. So they were sort of like naturalized Jews, but they were not Jews by birth. And then he says, uh, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them, that is the 120, speaking in our own languages, the wonderful works of God. Now, that's an important statement when it says the wonderful works of God, because that statement simply, it sums up uh, in, in just one line, the content of the message without actually stating what the message was. But it's clear that when they were, um, that they were, that the message contained something wonderful in it. Now we saw that from Isaiah's prophecy that it was a warning, that these foreign languages was a warning to Israel of its impending destruction, which happened in AD 70, 40 years later. <coughs> However, the content of the message itself was not destruction. Even though it was prophesied to be a sign of that destruction, the message that they were saying in these foreign languages was not, you know, God is going to destroy Jerusalem or anything like that. We get that from the context of the statement in Isaiah 28. But Isaiah also gives us the content of, the, of what will be said while God is speaking to this people with, uh, you know, through these foreign languages. The content, and, and you remember what that was, this is the refreshing, this is the rest, which with, with, um, whereby the weary may find rest. That is, this is how you enter into the kingdom, is essentially the content of, of the message spoken in tongues. And so when they, when they heard them speaking and they said, we hear them speaking the wonderful works of God, the, co the, the connotation of that is that they were talking about the future, that is, they were talking about the fulfillment of the prophecies in the Old Testament. They were talking about the way to enter into the kingdom of God. In fact, they were preaching the gospel of the kingdom, which is, in fact, what? Good news of the kingdom. All right. So, verse 12, it says, So, when, so they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What could this mean? Others mocking said, they are full of new wine. Now, this is very interesting. In verse 12 and 13, <clears throat> you have two classes of, of Jews who are from all these different nations who are responding and who are, who are trying to figure out what is all this about. And you have one group which seems to be serious and they're saying, you know, what, what does this mean? And they seem to be contemplating the significance of, of what was going on and they wanted they really did want answers they're asking a legitimate question but then it says but others were mocking and they said these are they're all full of new wine they're drunk so you know it's true that um, we have that we have those same two classes of people anytime the gospel goes out You'll have the mockers or the scoffers. In fact, Peter, um, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, when he was talking about the end times, he said that, that mockers and scoffers are going to come and say, where is the promise of his coming and, and all that. You've got this same category of people who scoff and mock at the things of God, who are not inquisitive, who don't really care 
about the things of God. They don't want to know. They don't want to find out. Their way of preserving their own lifestyle and so forth is to scoff and to mock at the holy things of God. And so we've got this class here as well. But what we're going to see uh, shortly as we move through this chapter is that this other class who were genuinely inquisitive, these are the ones who became Christians, as we'll see, and were baptized uh, towards the end of the chapter. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so Peter says, uh, verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. So men of Ju Judea includes the those who are residents of that area. But then he says, And all who dwell or who are staying in Jerusalem. And that is because these others who had come um, for Pentecost were staying there you know, for a few days while uh, for the festival. So he says, um, let this be known to you and heed my words. In other words, I'm going to answer your question about what does this really mean that what you're seeing and hearing. <clears throat> he says, verse 15, for these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. That is, that would be 9 a.m., uh, people don't normally get drunk, you know, between breakfast and 9 a.m., you know, they're already plastered. That doesn't normally happen. If people get drunk, they usually get drunk in the evening time. All right, so Peter's, that's his first argument. Then he says, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And now he begins to quote from Joel chapter 2. <clears throat> Before we get into Peter's quote from Joel chapter 2, I need to point out a problem. There's two problems <clears throat> with the common interpretation of this passage. When people look at verse 16, it says, But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. The word this is a pronoun. It has to have either an antecedent or a postcedent. Now, what does that mean? An antecedent is something that it's referring to that came before. A postcedent is something that it's referring to that's about to come afterwards. All right. So when you say this, you expect it to be referring to something in the immediate vicinity or context that uh, that is pointing to. If I say this uh, soda can that's here on my desk, this soda can points to a specific soda can, or this. All right. It's talking about something specific. So the question then is, what does this refer to? And, and you know, that, that question is critical to how we interpret what follows after this in Joel chapter 2, quoting from Joel chapter 2. Now, most Christians, when they read this passage, and I would say particularly those who have the, you know, charismatic, um, Pentecostal kind of mentality, you know, that we are supposed to be speaking in tongues and all this kind of stuff. They look at the word this here and think it's referring back to speaking in tongues. Well, it does not point back to speaking in tongues. In other words, that what they think is Peter was saying, but, you know, these aren't drunk like you suppose, but this, that is this speaking in tongues, is what was spoken by the prophet Joel and then quotes Joel to show that what's going on there currently is the complete fulfillment of what Joel prophesied. But what I'm going to tell you today is that Peter is not quoting Joel to show that it was being fulfilled at that time. He was quoting Joel for an entirely different reason. <clears throat> First of all, there's a grammatical problem if you take that other interpretation. That is, Peter was saying, this speaking in tongues is what was prophesied by the prophet Joel. There's three problems. Number one, Joel doesn't mention anything about speaking in tongues in his prophecy, either in the part that, that Peter quoted or the entire chapter or the entire book of Joel. There's nothing about speaking in foreign tongues or foreign languages. All right, that's number one. <clears throat> Secondly, in, in Joel's prophecy, he makes a very clear statement 
that this, that Peter's talking about here, where it says, it shall come to pass in the last days. The words last days in Joel's prophecy are, is literally in the Hebrew means after this or after these things. And so it has to follow after what Joel had just been talking about. Well, what, what was Joel just talking about in the context? He was talking about the coming of the kingdom of God. He was talking about Israel being restored to the land after they had repented. He was talking about God putting them back in their own land, never to be uprooted again, and God coming to dwell in the midst of Israel. And then he says, and afterward, I will pour out my spirit or my breath upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy and dream dreams and all that stuff that is mentioned there. It says after the coming of the kingdom, when God comes to dwell among his people. So we have a timing issue because if Peter is saying, <clears throat> if Peter is taking Joel's prophecy and saying what Joel prophesied in Joel 2, 26 through 32, those, if, he's, if Peter is grabbing those few verses out of the context of Joel, and if Peter is saying these verses that I just quoted to you are being fulfilled right now in front of your very eyes by these people speaking in tongues. If that's what Peter was doing, then he was absolutely violating the context of the book of Joel. That is, he was misusing the passage in Joel. He was completely ripping it out of its the flow of events that is are clearly said to take place. See, the word afterward... When it says, afterward, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, the word afterward has to mean after what just came before it. And that's talking about God dwelling among his people in the kingdom when he restores Israel back to the land. So we have a big problem. If we take this passage to be Peter to be saying that what you're seeing here with people speaking in tongues is the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy, we have a big problem with Peter apparently misapplying the passage in Joel, something that was talking about the coming of the kingdom, to be applying it to the day of Pentecost. That's a big problem. Now, here's the other problem. The other problem is a grammatical one, and that is the pronoun this that we see in verse 16, where it says, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. We, I said before that the pronoun this has to have a referent. It has to refer either to something prior to the statement or something immediately following the statement. But the rule in Greek grammar is that the pronoun must match its referent. That is, if it's talking about something before or after, regardless, it must match the referent, the thing that it's referring to, in its gender and in its number. Now, when I say number, I mean either singular or plural, okay? There's only two numbers when we're talking about grammar. Something is singular, that is, it's one, or it's plural, that is, it's more than one, right? Well, if it's singular, then it has to be talking about a thing that is also grammatically singular. Also, it's gender. Now, in Greek, you have three genders, just like we do in English. You have masculine gender, you have the feminine gender, and you have the neuter gender. Now, in English, we normally use the neuter for everything that's not personal. But for things that are personal, we'll use the masculine if it, if it's, it refers to something of, of, a, of a man. Or we'll use the feminine if it's talking about a woman. In Greek, it's not quite that clear cut. <clears throat> um, there's many, many words that are in the feminine gender. If any of you know uh, any Spanish or other languages as well, that's the case with those languages as well. That you'll have, you know, a lot, a lot of, um, um, like uh, a house. I think it's a. Is it a house? Um, um, I forget the Spanish word now for house. It just slipped my mind. But anyway, you'll have in Spanish you will have a, uh, a ma you'll have masculine terms, and they have a masculine pro uh, um, uh, article too. Like the in uh, Spanish 
If it's, if it's masculine, it'll be L, and if it's feminine, it'll be La, right? And I, there's probably a neuter one as well. I don't, I don't, my Spanish is like, no, I don't know Spanish. But anyway, you get the idea. There are, there are um, different nouns have a different gender. Some nouns in Spanish and in Greek will have a masculine gender, even though they're not masculine in nature, okay? Like, for example, in Greek, logos, which means word, is a masculine noun. And so any pronouns that refer to it by necessity have to be masculine in their gender. If you have another word like hope, which is feminine in gender, then any pronouns that refer to hope would have to be also feminine in gender. Okay, So we have to have, whenever we're dealing with pronouns, like the word this, we have to have agreement in both gender and in both number, singular or plural, with regard to the thing that it's referring to, okay? So if you say, if we say, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and by this we mean tongues, languages, then we have a big problem because we do not have either gender or number agreement. The, the word languages that's used throughout, or tongues, that's used throughout this passage is feminine in its gender, and it's plural. It's feminine and plural. But the word this in verse 16 is singular and it's neuter. So there is no agreement at all between this and speaking in tongues. There's no grammatical agreement. Therefore, we can say categorically, based on the rules of Greek grammar, that this does not refer to tongues. Okay? It does not. It cannot. Well, then what does this refer to? Well, if you, if you look at the grammar of the sentence, it is um, the neuter gender and the singular um, number is also used of uh, what was spoken by the prophet Joel. That is sp uh, spoken. All right. What was spoken. So what it's essentially saying is, what, jo what Peter is saying is, he's not saying this, speaking in tongues, is what the prophet Joel talked about. He's saying, he's saying to them, look, these guys are not drunk like you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what Joel said. Or, or we could, to, to, to clarify it in English so we don't make the mistake, we could say, but listen to what Joel said. Or, here is what Joel said. See, if we translate it as here, then in English, the connection between the pronoun and what comes after it is very clear. If I say, here is what Joel said, right? Or here is what the prophet Joel wrote. And grammatically, the agreement of gender and number fits perfectly interpreting it that way than when it does not work if you interpret it previously. So what Peter is essentially saying is, he, what he's doing is he's turning their attention away from the fact that people are speaking in foreign languages. And he's turning their attention away from that to a prophecy that Joel made. For his, And Peter's going to do that for his own purposes to turn their attention to the prophet Joel and what Joel had to say. All right. So what I want to do is I want to go back to Joel chapter 2. I just want to briefly comment on the flow of Joel, because Joel really, I mean, we have three chapters in the book of Joel, but Joel is really a very short book, and there were no chapter divisions. It originally was just all one letter, one prophecy of the prophet Joel, <clears throat> and it's all about the coming of the day of the Lord. It was uh, The context of it was that there had just been a plague of locusts that had come through and wiped out all of Israel's crops. And Joel then began to prophesy about the coming of the day of the Lord. And the implication was, look, look what has happened just from a plague of locusts. Look what God is going to do to you if you don't repent. 
and he talks about the coming of the day of the Lord where, and he talks about how much greater and more severe the coming of the day of the Lord is when God sends his angelic army to go through the land and wipe out and purge the land by the land of Israel by fire. And this is talking about at the second coming of Christ when he comes to purge the land in order for Christ to set up his kingdom. And so he talks about this angelic army. It starts in chapter 2. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. For it is at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come great and strong. The like of whom has never been nor will there ever be such after them. Uh, even for many successive generations. A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them it's a desolate wilderness. Nothing shall escape them. The appearance is like horses, and uh, and so forth, and they run like uh, the noise of chariots over the tops of mountains, and fire devours the stubble, and, and so forth. All right. And then later God calls them his, his army, God's army. And this is an angelic army. And it's being used, it's being kind of compared to the plague of locusts that had just come through um, later. And uh, so let's just skip down to verse, um, verse 10. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and moon grow dark. The stars diminish their brightness. The Lord, And this is the darkening of the sun and the moon at the coming of the day of the Lord, which is talked about in many passages in the Bible, including in the New Testament. It says, and the Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great. And by the way, when it's uh, this army here is the same army that's in Revelation chapter 19, when it talks about Christ returning on a white horse, and he's accompanied by his army. So, and these are angels, all right? And how do we know they're angels? Well, it's, uh, it's stated plainly in Matthew that um, uh, Jesus talks about when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him and so forth. All right. So anyway, he says, um, for his camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Now, at, after the end of verse 11, God begins to instruct Israel through Joel to, to return to him and to repent. And he talks in verses 12 through 17 about national repentance. That is the nation, the whole nation of Israel repenting and turning back to God and, you know, clothed in ashes and fasting and, and, and all this. I'm not going to get into all that because I don't really have the time. But this is what is going to go on during the time of tribulation when God renews the covenant um, and, and the temple is rebuilt and he sends Elijah and John as the two prophets to come and prophesy. And he allows Israel this window of repentance, this, um, which is also prophesied in the last chapter of Malachi. And so anyway, he's talking about that and how they need to return to God because the day of the Lord is coming uh, when God is going to destroy and he's going to send his angelic army in and just wipe out the land. And if they want to survive that, they had better return to the Lord. Um, and then beginning in verse 18, he then begins to talk about the kingdom. That is, after the day of the Lord and God has, has um, um, done these things, if his people will repent, as he said, then he begins to tell them about the promises of the kingdom and the abundance of the kingdom that he's going to provide for them. He says, um, the, verse 18, the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I send you grain and new wine and oil. You will be satisfied with them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove far from you the northern army. And so forth. He says, look at verse 21. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Uh, skip down to verse. Um, he talks about abundance of crops and so forth. Uh, verse 25. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you, and that's what he did uh, in chapter 1, which was a precursor to his angelic army. Um, you shall eat and, um, in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dwelt wondrously with you. 
My people, now notice this, my people shall never be put to shame. This is Israel. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God. There is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. So we've got God We've got God restoring Israel in the land. We've got him giving them abundance of crops. We've got God coming to dwell amongst them, to live with them in the land of Israel. And, and, um, and they will never more again be put to shame. Well, that has to be talking about the kingdom. All right? It has to be. But then look at verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream. And your young men shall see visions. And on my main servants and upon, excuse me, men servants, and on my main servants, I will pour out my spirit or my breath in those days. And I will show wonders in the heaven, in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. So, the point is that, that the day of the Lord is coming. They were instructed to repent so that they wouldn't be trampled down by it. And then if they repent, then he's going to send them all these blessings in the kingdom. He's going to come and dwell among them and live with them. And then he says, and afterward, after God comes to dwell among his people, he says, afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now, this is another point that is very critical. Notice he did not say, I will pour out my spirit or my breath upon some people or upon those who are baptized or upon, uh, you know, Christians. He's, the context is the whole nation of Israel. That the whole nation of Israel that repents and turns back to God in the end times. He says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, on every one of these people, the descendants of Israel that turn back to God in the last days. He's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams and so forth. All right, it's all flesh. Now, if you, I want you to uh, keep your finger here for just a moment. Go back to um, Jeremiah. Um, actually, uh, Jeremiah chapter 31. You may remember the prophecy of the coming of the new covenant. We have a similar statement there as well. In uh, Jeremiah 31, um, and, and by the way, this passage is, quoted in Hebrews chapter 8, um, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. It's quoted there in Hebrews 8. And it's essentially said that the, the new covenant had already begun with the coming of Christ. But the, the point that I want to show you from this passage is that the coming of the new covenant is something that's progressive. It's not something that it, it instantly occurred overnight and now it's in full force because some of the promises of the new covenant are not yet completely fulfilled and the 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 fullness of the new covenant is not going to be realized until the kingdom arrives until israel collectively as a nation repents and you also have to keep in mind that the new covenant was not promised to gentiles the new covenant was promised to Israel. He says in verse 31, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. That's the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. There's nothing here mentioned about the Gentiles. Now, we do partake in it as we're told in the New Testament. But the covenant was made with the nation of Israel. <clears throat> Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws, notice this, and notice it says after those days, 
after the days that he makes the covenant, he's going to do something more. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Again, he's talking to Israel, Judah and, and, and Israel. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. Now notice this. For they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So both of these prophecies, the prophecy of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31 and <coughs> the prophecy in Joel chapter 2, have to do with the kingdom because it's not until the coming of the kingdom when Israel as a nation is restored to the land and God completely fulfills the promises that he made to Abraham. That's when the new, the, all the benefits of the new covenant are going to be realized by the nation of Israel. And that's when these benefits here, where it says that afterward, you know, after uh, God has come to dwell among his people, that afterward he's going to pour out his breath upon all flesh, that is, all of Israel. And your sons and daughters will prophesy and, and, and so forth. All right? So the point, that I'm, the point that I need to really drive home here is that Joel's prophecy that Peter quoted is not about the day of Pentecost. The, uh, Isaiah 28 was about the day of Pentecost, where it talked about speaking in tongues. Joel's prophecy is about the coming of the kingdom and the abundant blessing that God is going to pour out upon his people Israel in the kingdom. All right? So, let's go back to Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> Verse uh, 15. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Or, again, this, or, um, let me see if I can rephrase that. These are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But, listen to what the prophet Joel said. That would be essentially the meaning of what Peter's saying, because he's saying the word this is applying to what comes afterwards, not what came before. All right. So, here is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So, he is... By doing that, he's turning their attention away from the speaking in tongues itself. And he's turning their attention to the prophecies about the coming of the kingdom of God and the abundant blessings that God is going to pour out upon the nation of Israel when he completely fulfills the new covenant that he has made. And part of that new covenant and its complete fulfill, fulfillment <clears throat> in the nation of Israel and Judah is that the abundance of the holy breath of God that is going to come upon them. And we see that actually in other passages of scripture as well about God's spirit being abundant among his people in the kingdom once the kingdom has arrived. And he's talking specifically about the nation of Israel. So here's what he says, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, or my breath. Your sons, that is Israel's sons, and your daughters, that is Israel's daughters, shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my maid servant, men servants, and my maid servants. I will pour out of my spirit or my breath in those days, and they shall prophesy. That is, they will be speaking the words of God. I will show what now? He says, I, I will show wonders in the heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the coming of that great and awesome day of the Lord. Now, look, right here, he's saying, Peter's saying, that these signs are going to occur before that happens, <clears throat> before the day of the Lord comes. The day of the Lord is the day that Christ returns when 
Israel's enemies are destroyed, where the land of Israel is purged by the angelic army so that God then can set up the kingdom of his son in the land of Israel and restore the land of Israel and restore Zion and Jerusalem and so forth. And so these things are going to take place before the day of the Lord comes when after which all these other things are going to be fulfilled. See, the problem with this passage when you look at it the other way is that it doesn't make a lot of sense. First of all, you've got Peter contradicting Joel. <clears throat> Secondly, you've got Pentecost and the day of the Lord being tied together in the context. But they're separated by 2,000 years. It doesn't make any sense. Why would, why would Peter even quote that latter part about the sun and the moon being darkened and the coming of the day of the Lord. Why would he even bother quoting that if he was simply saying that what you're seeing here now is the fulfillment, uh, you know, on Pentecost is the fulfillment of this passage because the day of the Lord has nothing to do with that. See? But it does have something to do with it because the promise that Joel was talking about takes place immediately on the heels of the coming of the day of the Lord. And so that's why Peter ties it together because those things are going to occur before Israel receives this great abundant blessing that God is going to pour out upon them when he fulfills the covenant that he made with um, Abraham. So we see Peter uh, uh, concludes his quote there in verse uh, 21. Now, um, I'm going to hold off um, on the rest of Peter's sermon. I was planning on finishing it today, but there's no way I'm going to do that. We're already uh, 45 minutes, so... Um, Next time, we'll begin in verse 42, and we're going to see how Peter takes Joel's promise of the coming of the kingdom and the great blessings that God is, is, has promised to bestow upon the nation of Israel when he brings them back into the land. We're going to see how Peter then begins to weave this narrative of Jesus the Messiah, the king, the anointed king of that kingdom, and how um, he has come now. Um, and and anyway, anyway, Peter's going to tie together the king with the kingdom, and that if they have any hope at all of entering into that abundant blessing that was promised in Joel's prophecy here about the holy breath of God poured out upon all of all of the nation of Israel, if they have any hope in that at all, then they're in big trouble because they already crucified the king of that. And then Peter tells them how to repent and be restored. Uh, later in the chapter. So we'll pick that up again um, next week, beginning in verse 22. All right. So God bless you all.